on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. A lot of ancient skills that people used have been lost. The idea is our bodies and minds were evolved to be practicing these life ways that our ancestors have for thousands and thousands of years. It's like the first time you blow an ember that you've created through friction into flame, instantly something is awoken in you because you'd created that thing that you know you need to survive without, you know, Bic being involved. Buckskin is really fabulous. It is super versatile. It feels really good straight up against your skin. This is everybody's history. We all come from mammoth hunters. We all come from people who wore hides. There's just no way around that. There's like a continuum between like flint napping and doing carpentry for yourself around your place. It's not just about something being purely primitive. It's about being able to do things for yourself. Episode 55 of the Wild Fed Podcast evolved to do this. Primitive Skills Modern World with Natalie Bogwalker is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Uplevel your immunity this season with Sir Thrival's colostrum powder, chaga and reishi medicinal mushroom dual extracts, and vitamin D3 K2. Colostrum has been shown to be three times more effective against flu than vaccine in high-risk patients. Chaga and Reishi regulate and modulate your immune system, and you've probably been hearing about the mounting evidence correlating vitamin D deficiencies with more severe COVID and flu outcomes. Sir Thrival carries the very highest quality vitamin D3 supplement, colostrum powder, and medicinal mushroom extracts found anywhere. Get them at SirThrival.com. This episode's also brought to you by Earthrunners. Earthrunners are minimalist, ancestrally inspired footwear with built in earthing technology. At the core of every pair of Earthrunners is a Hirachi sandal constructed in the style of those worn by the Tarahumara, the indigenous group of Mexico known for their incredible feats of endurance running, sometimes as much as 200 miles in a single session, and they do it all in their minimalist sandals. Earthrunners utilize that same design, but with cutting edge modern materials like Vibram soles and electrically conductive laces that, when combined with the copper plug in the sole connect an electrical circuit between you and the ground. Most shoes insulate you from Earth's electrical field, but Earthrunners reconnect you. Go to earthrunners.com and check out the lineup. The coupon code WILDFED gets you 10% off your order. Well, today's episode marks the one-year anniversary of the Wild Fed podcast, and I just want to thank you all for your incredible support, for subscribing to the show, and for all those five-star ratings and glowing reviews. We've had so many great guests, and there are so many awesome shows still to come. If you haven't subscribed to the show, please subscribe through whichever platform you listen on. That really helps us grow because those subscriptions are crucial to our ability to generate the ad revenue that funds this show. And if you haven't gone and left a rating and review on iTunes, that's one of the other ways you can really give back. So if you feel this show is providing value to you each week, then I'm personally asking you to do this one simple thing in return. Okay, it's two things. Well, technically, it's three things. Subscribe, rate, and leave a review. It'll only take you a moment, and you'll be helping to ensure that there'll be a second year anniversary in 2021. Also, in other exciting news, we are in the process of delivering episodes of the Wild Fed TV show to our cable partner right now. And season one of the Wild Fed TV show has now been expanded to 10 episodes from the original eight. Those will start airing in January, and we'll have more details for you soon. I'm personally really excited for this opportunity. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Today's show is a lot of fun. It's a conversation between me and Natalie Bogwalker of Wild Abundance. You've probably been hearing me promote Natalie's upcoming online hide tanning class, which is getting ready to kick off soon. I was blessed with a beautiful eight-point buck just a few days ago, the first one harvested right here at the Wild Fed headquarters, about 300 yards from where I'm recording right now. So that hide is in my freezer, and I plan to follow along with Natalie's class tanning that hide here at home. But Natalie does a lot more than hide tanning, and her backstory is really interesting. She's someone who spent years living extremely close to the land in a way that many of us have only ever dreamt of. And the lessons and skills that she's brought forward from that experience are really useful to all of us today. We had a great rapport in this conversation, so it's lively, inspiring, and informative. 
So enjoy this interview and consider joining me in her upcoming high tanning class. I'm really looking forward to producing some buckskin at home this year, all part of, as you'll hear in this episode, my future, and hopefully distant future, funeral regalia. Natalie Bogwalker, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here with you, Daniel. Tell us a little bit about what you do. I get the impression that you, I, you know, that saying like wear a lot of hats, but you're like a one woman band here. It seems like you got quite a lot going on. Tell us about yourself and tell us about Wild Abundance. Well, there is a lot going on, but it is not just me at this point. <laughs> Wild Abundance, we started it about, um, or I started it about 15 years ago. And at the time it was just me, but at this point there are a lot of people who make it happen and who teach classes and who run all sorts of all sorts of things to make everything work out perfectly. So, um, so yeah, I do um, building. I do natural building. I do a lot of gardening and always have, and I'm really into primitive skills, um, including hide tanning and other primitive skills. And I also am really into permaculture and have been practicing permaculture for the last 20 years or so. But you've also put together some events in the past too. Firefly is uh, an event down in North Carolina that you, are you associated with that or did you host that event? I started that event 13 years ago with one other person with Caleb Wallace. And then I was the director for 10 years. And <clears throat> just after I had my daughter, Hazel, I decided that I had no business running <laughs> with, of such scale. And so I, um, I gave it away and they've yeah. become a nonprofit and it's, it's a really lovely, sweet event and has been a big part of my life for a long time, but I am not on the board. I'm not managing it at all. <laughs> I just show up and teach and it's pretty awesome. I it's feel really like saying congratulations. Oh, thank <laughs> you. you sound happy thank about you. that. Yeah. Oh. It's really sweet to have something that you put so much time into and that you started and was kind of your baby and to see it still like live on and even without, um, even without being actively part of it, I think it'll probably be similar to when my daughter leaves the house. So we'll <laughs> How do you come by all of this, uh, this sort of way of living? Because it's hard to just stumble your way into this stuff because this stuff isn't easy. And uh, it's, a, it's a narrow and rocky path uh, compared to the sort of, you know, that wide and easy path that gets people, you know, into the sort of midlife crisis. So, you know, how did you, how do you come by all of these things that you're doing? What's the backstory? Well, you know, I was hit by a car. I was, I was actually a genetic engineering student in college. I was very studious no. and I got hit by a car. I mean, my idea was that I was going to help find a cure for AIDS. I wasn't like trying to figure out like GMO. You were going to work for Monsanto? No, that wasn't my plan. <laughs> but, um, but I got hit by a car and, you know, in a lot of our ancestral people, no matter who we are, had initiation rights, you know, when you entered into adulthood. And I think that, you know, our culture doesn't hold that very well. And I think being hit by that car was, in fact, this huge initiation for me. And it made me question everything about my life. And so I um, finished out the quarter and then I quit school and I went traveling and I learned a lot. And I kind of explored like what what um like there's this idea i can't remember the writer but he talks about finding the place where your gave your greatest gifts and the world's greatest needs meet and that being like your life path and so when i went traveling and i think that's such a good thing to do in one's early 20s and i'm and late teens and i went traveling and i realized that i wanted to learn um how to grow food and so I went back to school. I traveled several times after that and after school and in between various school situations. And I studied ecological agriculture and then um, got into growing food. But then I realized in school that I didn't want to be a farmer because the economics of it are just, and the fact that uh, all the farmers that I knew had really horrible back problems. And so <laughs> I decided that, um, that I wanted to work with food. And then in that path, it's a very long story, but in that path, I ended up um, 
getting really into wild foods. And so I've been into wild foods for about 20 years. That's been a huge passion of mine. And I was, my mom actually introduced me to wild foods when I was like eight. And um, so it was exciting to me, but then it became this huge passion where like my politics and my passions and my taste buds all t came together to like really get into wild foods. And then that was my pathway into other primitive skills. And so then I found this community of people that practice more ancient life ways and at this gathering called the Earth Skills Rendezvous. And so I learned a lot there. And then through the same community of people, I met other people and I actually moved to a place called Wild Roots. It's a community that was very focused on wild foods. And then they also like practiced, um, practice primitive skills. And so I ended up when I think right where, around when I where turned are they 23, located? it's in, um, it's not still around to the same extent that it was when I was a big part of it, but um, it's, it's near Asheville, North Carolina. And so I um, soon, I lived in a tent the first winter I lived there and then, which is in the mountains in North Carolina, it sounds warm, but the mountains <laughs> get pretty cold. <laughs> And then I built myself a bark lodge, a Catawba style bark lodge. Um, and then I lived in that and we started all of our fire with friction, um, with a bow drill. And we got all of our water from the spring and from the creek. And um, yeah, that was just my life. And I practiced primitive skills. I made my money by selling crafts. And like I tanned hides and made clothing and sold it and like custom clothing and I made brooms and I made baskets and that was my life for five years. So it was super hardcore. For people who are listening, who uh, are, are interested in wild foods, but maybe haven't come through the, there's so many like avenues through which people arrive at these similar conclusions. And mm -hmm. for people who are listening here, who aren't familiar with the primitive skills world, can you kind of give people like a quick primer on what that world is is and and kind of what kind of things uh you're doing in that in i guess you know scene yeah definitely so a lot of ancient skills that people used for thousands and thousands of years to be able to exist in relative harmony with the rest of the web of life have been lost you know like modern culture has made it so that even indigenous people are not generally practicing, I mean, in some places they still are, but in most places are not still practicing those earth-based life ways. And so primitive skills kind of got their start in the 60s with some of these back to the landers who started learning from a lot of, especially indigenous people, but also studying, um, studying primitive technologies of our ancestors all over the world and have, and for to some degree like there's this there's this journal called the journal of primitive technology and it's like very academic and so there's this academic like experimental archaeology side to it where I like, people, I like that term a lot that term resonates with me for some reason i like it, it it's super fun term and so there's some people who like live totally normal you know everyday lives they're a lawyer or a doctor or a um work at a factory or whatever and then on the weekends they um do some flint napping, which is like <laughs> taking stones and hitting them together and making arrowheads and stuff like that. And then there's some people who um, just happen to hit the timing right and, and feel really brave and decide to extract themselves from more conventional lifestyles and live their whole life in a way that is practicing these primitive technologies. And the idea is that it's like our bodies were and minds were evolved to be, um, to be practicing these life ways that our ancestors have for thousands and thousands of years. And there's also a really cool thing about, about this bridge of bringing these ancient skills through into um into modern day because who knows when we're going to need them again and so many of them are lost and so to be able to carry those skills forward is super important and I lived like super hardcore in this lifestyle for like I said about five years and then 
when I started the Firefly Gathering, which was my intention was to take these skills, not just super primitive stuff, but also just generally earth-based life ways like organic gardening, you know, wild foods and um, hunting skills and natural building skills and stuff that isn't necessarily primitive, but is sustainable. Like I mm-hmm. tried to create this bridge between sustainability and the, the, um, the primitive life way stuff. And that's what the firefly gathering was all about. And then once I was in it and organizing it all, I really needed internet access. <laughs> and so it's, um, it's kind of a funny thing because it's like what my passion for sharing these life ways in some ways made me not live quite so deep and hardcore in it to the point yeah. where now I live in a log cabin that I built, you know, and we have, internet that comes in and we have a big solar system and and we have power and these sorts of things so i'd like to kind of comment on this but i i don't it's not really a question i'll just let i just want to say some things and then kind of let you riff on it because there's uh there's this idea here that i got toward the end of what you're saying there which is about sort of a balance between carrying those things into the future but then also living in the moment that we're actually in too Mm -hmm. um which i think is really important and i'm not i've never been deep in the primitive skills world i don't have a lot of the dirt time as everyone likes to call it but um, but I've definitely flirted around the edges of that for a while and, and struggled with the practicality of some things and other things that really enriched my life a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like, you know, I love being around people who are dressed sort of like Otzi the Iceman, you know, I get like really excited <laughs> by that whole thing. But yeah. there's this other component of it, like you were just saying about... Um, So like I was saying, I'm not deep in it, but I think it's so, I really want people, some people to be really deep in it, you know, because Mm -hmm. it's like, as you said, we don't ever know when we'll need, uh, like if there's ever a reset button, we'll need that stuff. And then if there never is, it just seems like it's so important that it's kept alive. I've commented a lot on this show, so this is probably old news for people who've heard me say it a bunch of times, but I think about like how people reenact the Civil War or how people reenact the Renaissance era, you know, and these like these weird, like kind of points in history. But then it's like, what seems like the most important thing are these fundamental earth skills that are, that are sort of ubiquitous around the world and transcultural, the thing that allowed us to kind of get to where we are today. And the idea of that stuff being lost seems like kind of nightmarish to me. So Mm -hmm. that it's really important that these, even if it's at a museum level, that these things are kept alive, that there's a cadre of people who are doing it. So I'm curious your thoughts on that, just like reasons why keeping it alive is so important. And then also what, what it looks like to try to balance that with, you know, being a person who's, who's not, I guess, and I'm, I'm not suggesting you or any, anyone that, you know, I'm not saying anyone specifically doing this, but you could imagine how somebody could almost get a little out of touch with the moment they're actually in. Uh, mm-hmm. They went so deep. So how do, you, how do you see balancing those things? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that keeping the skills alive is not only like an important ethical or aesthetic thing to do. It's really fun. Like <laughs> doing, <laughs> yeah. practicing these skills, you know, whether it's like making a bow or whether it's tanning a deer hide or whether it's, um, whether it's carving wood, like these things is like, there's a reason why humans did this for so long. And it's like kind of gotten into our bones. And so oftentimes when people get to practice these skills for the first time, like I have, I have this program called earth skills and permaculture. And so it's like people get there, I think, because they hit something on the internet about permaculture. And then they're like, oh, this is really cool. It's permaculture plus all this other stuff. And I think that um, when they first start trying to make a friction fire by rubbing sticks together, like there's something like deep inside you that like comes Mm -hmm. alive. And so that doesn't come alive in the same way or in the same quality. Like when someone like is playing a game on their phone or something Mm -hmm. like that, you know, it's like something really deep. And I think that 
I think that having an element of that in our lives, some sort of like ancestral awakening. And I mean, honestly, I think sex is probably the closest thing that we have to it in our everyday lives because it's something that, you know, humans have been doing for so long, but what else in and, our and everyday that, lives? And that you don't require industry to facilitate for you, right? Because <laughs> like when you were just saying about, I mean, hopefully when you were just saying about friction fire, it's like the first time you blow an ember that you've created mm-hmm. through friction into flame, you're like instantly something is awoken in you because you did it. You created that thing that you know you need to survive without, you know, mm-hmm. Bic being involved or without, yeah. you know, industry being involved. And, and I'm not against that those things exist or anything of, you know, mm-hmm. but, yeah. but knowing how to do things without industry, like you said, with sex, it's like, that's something too naked people, you know, literally naked <laughs> the way you came into the world. You yeah. don't need an intermediary, right? So mm-hmm. sort of removing that seems like a piece of what you're talking about. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, and I like that. I like what you just said about removing the inter- intermediary. It's like you can, you can like come alive in a really big way. So, so that's like, that's something that I think is really important and really special about the like purely primitive skills, you know? And that is like, to me, like there's this whole range that I like to occupy. And a lot of the primitive skills, like, you know, honestly, when I start a fire these days, I grab a lighter, you right. know? Yeah, me, and, too. me too. And I'm a very, like I teach friction fire. Like I've made thousands and thousands of friction fires in my life and that's awesome. And the when calluses like, to prove it. Oh, I do. <laughs> and, and when there's some special event or it's somebody's right. birthday or we're like, I'm with my apprentices and we're starting a fire for their, for their um, wilderness solo or whatever, you know, I'm going to start it with friction. But if it's, if it's just like, okay, it's cold in the cabin. I want to start a fire. <laughs> it's definitely the big lighter. And, you know, I think the big lighter is like a pretty awesome technology. Yeah. And I think that, so I think there's really a balance between those purely primitive skills, which are like not necessarily the most practical things in the world, but that like, that like light this fire inside your heart. And then there's the, like the earth skills, which include things like, things like natural building and things like, things like permaculture, where you're really working with the landscape to create like a homeostasis or homeodynamis as, as some people like to say, like a, like a dynamic homeostasis that, that is in balance, but not static. And so the, um, being able to practice skills that are using my body and that are good for the earth and that, um, and that promote balance and that also promote community. Like that's, it's, what I'm all about, you know, and whether it's, you know, I teach like women's carpentry classes and that's definitely not a primitive skill, you know, we're using like all these intense power tools, but it's a similar thing where we're being able to do something with our hands. And instead of just like going and buying a thing that we need, we're making the thing. And so I think that there's like a continuum between like flint napping and say, and like, doing carpentry for yourself around your place where it's not just about something being purely primitive. It's about the excitement and the empowerment and the like the fire get, that gets lit inside you about being able to do things for yourself, you mm-hmm. know? And, and for me that I'm especially motivated. I mean, I teach people of all genders, but I'm especially motivated to do that with women because I think that's something that, that, can be missing in a lot of women's lives is that empowerment to be able to, to be able to make things yourself or tan a hide or hunt or do um, or build yourself a shed or a tiny house or whatever it may be. Uh, Man, there's a lot there I want to talk about. Uh, Okay. So I'll just really quickly want to say with a Bic lighter, by the way, I have found that uh, it's about six or seven years that they'll last vacuum sealed with uh, <laughs> with moisture nice. absorbers, and then the flints cool. start to go. But anyway, uh, one of the cool things too, I think, is when you have done a lot of friction fire, then when you flick the bick, you sort of understand how it works in a different way. You're like, mm-hmm. oh, I get what all these different parts of the lighter are and what they do, because now I understand the fundamentals of what it takes to bring fire into the world. Uh, and so it's not such a magic technology anymore. You like, mm-hmm. then you understand it. I think that's really empowering. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about what you just said about women too, but I first, I just want to go back because you mentioned this car accident you had. Uh-huh. 
And I just wanted to maybe flesh that out a little bit more if you were willing to talk about it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I was I was riding my bike. Um, I was living in Seattle at the time. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and I was in college and I was riding my bike down the Burke Gilman Trail and I came to an intersection and looked both ways and then went and this car came around a corner and hit me on my bike and my helmet broke her windshield. And then I was on her car for probably 30 feet until she slammed on the brakes. And then my momentum with my momentum, I flew into a telephone pole. Oh my goodness. And it was very dramatic. If I had a helmet on. <laughs> Dude, I probably wouldn't be talking with you. Yeah, if I had. Not, not so clearly anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's true. It's very true. Um, and yeah, the recovery was, it was interesting. I was actually living in a cooperative house in Seattle. Um, and a couple of my housemates were, and one was a massage therapist and one was an acupuncturist. And so their, her insurance company like just really didn't want me to sue. And they were happy to pay for like whatever medical treatment I needed. Mm -hmm. And so I got introduced to um, acupuncture, which at the time, like I had no idea what it was, you know, and I couldn't, I, I couldn't feel one of my feet for three months. And then after my wow. first acupuncture appointment, I could feel that foot, which was fabulous. Was anything broken or? No, like so crazy. Nothing was broken. Yeah. Um, but wow. my spine was really messed up and I had a lot of nerve damage. A lot of trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Wow. So, so acupuncture was like a, opened you up to some other ways of healing? Yeah, other ways of healing. And I think also just other ways of seeing the world, uh -huh, you know, yeah. like, I mean, I think growing up, like I was really into science, obviously, like if I was looking at doing genetic engineering <laughs> and, <laughs> and like the idea of like, sci I mean, I think that we are kind of spoon fed this idea all through school that science is the answer to everything, to all of our problems. And it was cool to, um, to have that experience with the acupuncture and just that whole experience itself and with traveling, just seeing that like the Western scientific model yeah. is not necessarily as successful as other ways. Now I want to talk about that because what year were you born? 78. Okay. Me too. Uh, what oh, what cool. month? November. Okay. I'm September. So oh, uh, cool. I am your senior technically. You so. are. You uh, are. <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, this is, I want to be careful here because, you know, we're, well, I guess we're technically middle-aged, but only just, <laughs> just touching it, just touching it. Uh, yeah. But, you know, when I was younger, I was very quick to criticize things that I didn't understand the historical context of. So it's really, and I see that in young people a lot, like they want to oh, yeah. tear down systems, but they don't necessarily understand how the system got there. Uh, yeah. And if they did, they would have, maybe they'd still want to change it, but maybe they would understand that, hey, this was to replace something that was actually worse. And people who <laughs> put this system here were revolutionaries. Yeah. So like, yeah. if you look at sort of the grip the church had on, um, you know, through the dark ages on people's paradigm on literacy on mm. on thinking you see yeah. that the scientific revolution and the enlightenment was this critical step forward but now mm -hmm. we're at this place so you know so i want to say with all, with all due respect now yes, I want to criticize yes, science, yes, yes. right yeah. so i really like what you just said because i step back sometimes and i go how is nobody noticing that science is how we got to all these problems like like we're looking at this global warming problem or this climate change problem. Mm. We're looking at this um, habitat loss. We're looking at what's happening with digital technologies and social media and all of these, all of these products of science have eroded the human connection to the landscape and to one another. And all of the pollution is a result of technology that came through science. And so everybody's so pro science, like we really got to keep pushing this stuff forward, but it seems like very few people have realized that science is actually how we got in this mess. And so I really appreciate what science is, but decoupled from um, ancestral ways, like it can get really, really out of balance. And I feel like where we're at now is this place where we've given over to science the way we gave over to religion in the dark ages. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. and now it, it's almost like it's a cult 
And if you don't buy into it, I mean, you get called a science denier. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, hang on, you guys sound just like the church sounded. (laughs) You know, do you know what I mean? Like, it's really weird because I I think that the methodology of science, it's incredible what it allows you to do, but it certainly divorces everything from its meaning. We'll get right back to the show in a moment, but first, WildFed is proud to be sponsored by Red Kill Mountain Homestead Farms. Red Kill Mountain in upstate New York is home to a wild apple savanna of unparalleled beauty and diversity. In fact, there are nearly 2,000 unique apple varieties there, and these were not planted by human hands, but instead are naturally occurring pippins from seeds deposited by livestock that were grazing there in the last century. Recently rediscovered, these apples are one of the wild wonders of the Northeast. We're in the last couple of weeks of this year's apple season, so now is the time to place your order for their apple boxes. There are two offerings, the 1.5-pound apple tasting box and the 3-pound apple cleanse. Both offer a selection of unique wild fruits you've never tasted before. And remember, each apple is a vehicle for at least five seeds, each programmed to grow a unique apple variety. These seeds are viable for up to seven years, so in addition to sampling these incredible wild fruits, you're also investing in potential food security for the future. The apples at Red Kill Mountain Homestead Farms are my favorite in the world, and I highly recommend you give them a try. Go to RedKillMountainHomesteadFarms.com and use the coupon code WILDFED20 to get 20% off your order. Again, these are not the cloned, irrigated, chemically fertilized, and pesticide sprayed apples designed to withstand those supermarket shelves. These are wild fruits that have never been irrigated, fertilized, or grafted, and now you can try them yourself. Again, it's RedKillMountainHomesteadFarms.com, and the coupon code WILDFED20 gets you 20% off your order. Now, back to the show. Yeah, totally, totally. And from heart connection. I mean, there's so much, there's so much like being human. Like, I hope it's beyond like being like an automaton, you know, (laughs) but, and it's, and it is such a tricky thing to talk about too, because I mean, I think that I, like, I personally think that we are headed towards some really crazy climate stuff. And I think that science can be really helpful for showing that and for, for examining it. But I think that, you know, when it comes to like relating with another person or even my relationship with my food, like I'd way yeah. rather have like a spiritual relationship with my food or, and like, I mean, I know that hunting is a really big part of your life, like having a spiritual relationship with your prey and having a spiritual relationship with the other people that are around you and with your landscape and with the land. Like, I think that that is just, it's so much richer. And it's something that I think that my personal Um, my personal like route through the way that I've seen the world and being really like having those just scientific blinders on and logical blinders on, it can make it really hard to be able to see the richness that's all around us, I think. Yeah. And you were saying before about like other ways of seeing the world besides the scientific methodology and paradigm. And Mm -hmm. I, I think like if you look at food, as you were just talking about you know, it's funny to me how you can use science to prove opposing theories, right? So you can mm. be like, the the vegans will pull out all the science on why, <laughs> ve- and then the now the now the carnivores are pulling out all of the science. And I just step back and go, like, can you guys see what you've done? Like, we just went through this thing of all you should eat is plant food, no animal food. That's the way science proves it. <laughs> Everybody needs to be vegan, and then mm. we pendulumed. I, people, I can't believe people are out there talking about this carnivore diet without stepping back and going, Oh, I get what's happened. I just, we just swung to the other extreme. Like, like, like what's next? Like radical omnivory. Like we always have done, you know, like historically always have done. Like all we have to do is step back and maybe look at pre-industrial people. And like, we kind of know, Hey, everybody's omnivores. Look at that. Amazing. Uh, but, But like this thing of trying to use science to like prove Uh, how to eat seems like we just get fatter and sicker and more like diabetic and more, it's not working. And then you kind of just, when you start to have a relationship with wild foods, like a lot of things are like, Oh, they're really obvious. You know, you don't need science to explain it. And 
maybe science will get to that place where it's better at this and maybe it's just really early in, but it seems like I already am like came wired with software that shows me how to eat. Like I don't need, I can't like get with the Fitbit thing that everybody does, you know, like the, like where they're like tracking their sleep and tracking their steps and tracking their, I just, I'm like, how, how are you doing that? Like, why are you doing that? Can't you just feel how you feel? Like, I feel hungry. Like I don't need my computer to be like, ding, it's time to eat your 200 calories. <laughs> you wow. know, but, but, uh, but you said you started to mess with wild foods when you were eight, huh? What, what were, what were you introduced to and, and how did that come around? Um, I think the first thing my mom ever showed me was oxalis, which is basically wood sorrel yeah. on the West Coast. And that was really cool. And I was, it's, I think you have a similar history. I can't remember, but I was, I was vegetarian for a long time yeah, me too. until yeah. I was from the age five when my mom, like I was very inquisitive as a child, big surprise. And I asked her where meat came from. And she was like, you know, those cows that live down the road, well, they <laughs> kill them and then they hang them up in a giant refrigerator and then they get cut up into pieces. <laughs> and that's what meat is. And I was like, oh my God, I want to have nothing to do with this. And Where's so that I wood became, sorrel at? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I became vegetarian when I was five and I was, I was vegetarian and then I became vegan. And then my body just started to feel horrible. Mm -hmm. And um, that was, I can't remember exactly, like, very early twenties, I think. And so then I started eating wild meat, um, in my, in my early twenties, but because it just seemed so much more ethical than eating dairy to me mm -hmm. at the time. But, um, but anyway, to start out, yeah. So my mom was really into, um, going on plant walks. And at the time when I was like eight years old, I found it to be quite boring as I'm sure I would have found anything that my mom did <laughs> to be pretty boring. Um, but I absorbed a lot and I was into the wild foods. And so I would go and pick wild huckleberries and pick blackberries and bring them home and my mom would make pies or whatever and it was very sweet and um and then when I was in college um when I went back to college one of my friends was studying ethnobotany and he he um did some plant walks with me and I was like oh my god I already know a lot of this stuff <laughs> because oh, my yeah. mom you know shared it with me when I was young and I supposedly wasn't paying attention but you know when you're a little kid it gets in there right it percolates in. in yeah totally and so that just became a huge huge passion of mine and I like I don't know when I was like 20 I started doing doing um medicinal and edible plant walks oh wow so, yeah and what about um, on the animal side? Like when you started to eat wild meats, where were you getting those from? Well, the first the first wild meat that I ate was um, was crabs because I after after I quit college, one of the things that I did I got a job, you know, and so instead of um, having no money, I had a little bit of money, and so I started and I lived in a very um, a very uh, frugal way with all these. I lived in a 13 person cooperative house and we all bought food <laughs> together and everything. And like all my rent yeah. and all my food, it was like 300 bucks a month. So wow. working full time, I had plenty of money and I learned how to scuba dive. And so we would, we would catch crabs. You were like in the Puget home. Sound or something? In the Puget Sound. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Cause such an awesome, uh, I mean, I don't know how it is today, but there's a lot of um, seaside food available there. Isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot. And so I, I started with crabs and then I had a friend who was a hunter. God, that must have been so good after, because, you know, oh, yeah. like I think a lot of people who have been vegan, they start with like dairy and then they go like, then they'll do that thing of like, well, I only eat white meat as if like there's something about like the color of <laughs> meat, like affects the consciousness yeah. of the animal or something. I don't quite know what yeah. that's about. But. It's funny because pigs are white meat and they are yeah. very, very smart. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, right. You can even implant their body parts into humans. But, um, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but the idea of going to seafoods and shellfish is really interesting. Mm -hmm. So that must have been amazing for you. Yeah. I mean, I felt so good. Like it felt, I mean, I hadn't eaten meat in, in 15 years, you know, and so the texture was really 
weird for me. Like it felt, I mean, for so long I'd been like programmed to be vegetarian and the idea of like eating flesh and like my teeth chewing on flesh was like really Especially intense. crab. It's like all yeah. up in your teeth. It's like, yeah. so it's got all that like stringy, you know, striations yeah. to it. It's true. And then I went to venison. Um, one of my friends had some deer meat that he'd hunted. And so I ate some of that. And then believe it or not, the next meat was I was traveling in Central America and I somehow ended up at a bull castration party. Come on. So, <laughs> I know, it's such a crazy thing. And so they were eating um, testicle cow testicle ceviche which is like raw like cooked in lime juice <laughs> cow testicles and i was like well i'm and at the time chemically I was pretty cooked much, in lime juice <laughs> yeah exactly and so i was um i was still mostly vegetarian and just eating wild food but you know that's something it's a life once in a lifetime opportunity you know to eat. and and then, um, and then when I moved to Wild Roots in North Carolina, we started eating, we ate a lot of roadkill. So I ate raccoons and possums and all sorts of, all sorts Ooh, of critters. Possums are not real popular on the menu these days. Oh man, possum makes the world go round. It's so good. <laughs> like a possum curry, like a green, uh -huh. a green coconut curry with possum meat is so good. You just have to remove the glands properly. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, very, true very that's true of a lot of animals. Yes, <laughs> yes indeed. But I like raccoons a little bit better. But but whatever the case is, bear was like this huge experience for mm -hmm. me. And I'm not in. I don't hunt bear. But um, but the first time I ate bear meat, it was like something came alive in me. Like yeah. it was just so potent and powerful. Um, so yeah, I've eaten a lot of different animal meats. I want to say that I, I really love roadkill. I don't know why the, I, I don't know if they figured out who I am or something. They don't call me anymore for roadkills. <laughs> I was getting like a dozen a year. They'd call me. I'd go scoop up a deer. Sometimes I get a couple a day and wow. uh, it was fantastic. And now it's like, I don't get any calls, but my friends do. And I'm like, I think they, <sighs> I've gotten blacklisted or something. I don't know. Like this guy doesn't need it or something. But uh, yeah. What do you think's up with that? Uh, well, I'd love your opinion on the bear thing. Uh, I'm a, I am a bear hunter and, and, um, yeah. And we eat quite a lot of bear in the house. In fact, I was eating bear today. And um, yeah. it does have quite an impact on people emotionally, psychologically, you know, physically. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And, and like sort of what is bear for you? Um, I Not think a scientific, I, but a me from a meaning yeah. perspective, I guess. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think I passively, um, when bear meat comes to me, I like give – thanks and eat it, mm. you know, whether it's like a roadkill or whether there's a hunter who's hunted it and he gives me some of it. Um, I used to live at Wild Roots and Wild Roots is right next to um, the game lands of the National Forest. And so there were a lot of people who, and the, the, it's a big bear hunting area. It's like a huge part. And the part. biggest bears in the country, really outside of, I mean, I think even bigger yeah. than Alaska, right? Those black bears are gigantic there. I, I don't know if they're as big as grizzlies, but I mean, they definitely can be no, like- No, oh, sorry, three, biggest black bears. Biggest yeah. black bears in the yes. country are North Carolina. Yes. Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah, they're they're big, some of them. Um, but sometimes the hunters would, would kill little bears, you know? And I think that I think that they just gave us, they gave us a lot of bear meat because they would go through our property to get access to, uh, yeah. um, to the game lands. And it was, I just really wasn't that into, like they have- dogs with radio collars and they're all just sitting in their trucks, you know, waiting for, for the collar to indicate that the, that the dogs are barking up a tree, that the dogs have treed a bear and then they'd go kill the bear. And often it would be a younger bear. And I just, I just wasn't really into it. It just didn't seem super honoring of the bear. Like, I think it was really different before radio colors. And like, I mean, I've gone bird hunting and you like, you're chasing those dogs. <laughs> you yeah, really yeah. have to work for it in a big way. But, um, but with this, this whole scene, it just, it just felt kind of sad to me. Like that the, cause I think of bears as being um, pretty close to humans, honestly, like they're, um, 
And I think that's part of why, I mean, not that I'm going to be eating any human meat, you know, but I think that's part of why the bear meat is so potent. Well, life is long. Body. Life is long. Yeah, and who like, knows what's who, See right. how things end up. But, <laughs> but um, I hope not. I hope I'm, I hope I'm not in that place. I doubt. I don't, I don't think you're going to need to. <laughs> yeah, I hope um, but whatever the case is, I think, I think of bears as, um, as kind of kindred, I think, mm-hmm. to yeah. me. And so... I don't hunt them. And I'm, I don't think it's like unethical to hunt them. I think a lot of people hunt them in ways that are much more honoring. I think that the ways that I've seen them hunted, I just didn't resonate with. And I'm not going to say it's like bad or whatever. I just didn't resonate with it. And, um, and you know, when they would bring us a bear that was like a younger bear or whatever, I, I again, I, I skin the bear, I tan the hide, I – was very happy to utilize its meat, but I just, I didn't necessarily care for the way that it was killed. I, I, I hunted down in North Carolina for bear. And, uh, I remember some guys trying to get me to shoot a sow and these three cubs, oh. you know, and I was just like up here, you know, cause we hunt dogs up here and I'll just say on the side of radio collars, what's nice about the radio collars is when you hunt back country, sometimes your dogs get lost for multiple yeah. days. And so knowing yeah. where your dogs are can be really, really nice. But, totally. um, but I understand, you know, what you're saying, especially having hunted down there and seen it a, a bit there, but uh, just, you know, up here, we, we don't, that's not part of our culture. We wouldn't yeah. shoot, shoot a, a sow with cubs or shoot the cubs, but yeah. uh, obviously it happens in some places. And uh, I was pretty surprised by that too. Cause you know, I'm somebody who kind of, I feel very similar to you, but I've been very immersed in lots of different hunting scenes yeah. and, uh, and not everybody seems to feel that kindredness. I'm surprised by it, honestly, because it's like hard. I, I don't know how I could like shut my eyes to <laughs> sort of, you know, the majesty of bears, but. Um, and especially when you skin them. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> it's like, oh, wow. I mean, it's kind of the same thing with a raccoon. I mean, this is a little graphic, I'm sure, but I think your listeners can probably take it. But like when you skin a raccoon or you skin a bear, like when you take off the fur coat, like there's a lot of similarities to um to another animal (laughs) yeah it's interesting how much a raccoon and a bear are they're so similar i think there was a lot of for a long time there was debate about um whether pandas were raccoons or they were bears (laughs) Um, Fascinating. yeah but uh, i think they've finally landed on the bear side but uh maybe (laughs) through genetics or something but um yeah anyway really interesting what about bear fat have you worked with it much Oh, I love bear fat. I mean, you can't. It's so the best, good. right? Isn't so it the best? Good. It's so good. Yeah, I've 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 rendered a lot of bear fat. Bear cracklins. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I know. I know, right? It's so good. Man, they're I've, sweet, man. I could eat so many of them. They're so good. Oh, I had this one. We had this when I lived out at Wild Roots. It was it was pretty funny because you know we were like you know just pretty much wearing deer hides and like nice deer hides, but but we're like pretty rough, you know, around the edges, but we would occasionally have fancy tea parties. <laughs> so <laughs> one time we had one of these fancy tea parties because, and we would also have fancy dance parties, but one of my friends was leaving, um, leaving land to go move to Baltimore or something. And we made these bear cracklins with honey and almond flour, oh, like dusted on so them. Nice. So oh, good. That sounds delicious. But yeah, I love bear fat. And you know, groundhog grease is also like, huh, okay, you know, yeah. supposedly it's, um, it's, it's a med- very strong medicine because groundhogs are eating like all these, all these like medicinal plants all the time. And so the, a lot of the old timers around here will talk about groundhog grease and how it's just a cure all for everything. Uh, no kidding. Yeah, that's really interesting. People talk a lot about like, oh, in the primitive scenario, like fat is so hard to come by and you yeah. know, people die enough fat starvation and, and I'm, or, you know, protein, excess protein. And I'm kind of like, man, I find fat in everybody. I've rendered turkey fat before, yeah. you know, it's like I've rendered squirrel fat before. I mean, there's just fat. I find fat all over the place. But um, I want to, I got this question about wild foods for you that I think um, you might be sort of qualified to answer. So like right now I have a turkey broth going upstairs and I got a couple squirrels I got to go skin here after we talk and, and I've got bear fat that needs to be rendered and I need to reorganize my freezers and I've got, I've got these cranberries sitting that I need to get into sauce and, and it gets really overwhelming because <laughs> I'm doing it on my own, you know, and it's yeah. um, when, if we were to go back 
30,000 years, we mm-hmm. would see that it's like 30 to 50 people working together oh, yeah. to eke out a wild living on the landscape and that yeah. you, you need this cooperation and typically those were between kin. Um, uh-huh. And today we are, with those of us trying to do wild foods at any serious level are doing it usually in the nuclear family. Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult. So I'll watch people come in and they'll be like, I want to, I want to live off wild food. And I'm always like, well, good luck, man, because <laughs> it's really, you need, you need a, you don't have the land base anymore. I mean, I can't go very far before I'm running into somebody else's, you know, backyard. And yeah. that, so I don't have that massive tracts of land, but I also don't have 30 hands processing the rice with me or processing yeah. the acorns with me. So can you speak about having done a lot of cooperative stuff, having done these bigger events like Firefly, about how you see these things today that we're practicing, but in the, in the absence of community, um, I don't know if that make, the question's making sense, but like, obviously you've noted this, that, that you can't really do it. Like two people can't really eke it out that easily. You need a lot of people. Eh? And so how, how do you see all that? You need a lot of people. And there's also like so many tricks and technologies, yeah. like more primitive technologies that we're missing. I mean, it's crazy. Like, um, you know, thinking about acorn processing, for example, like there's, there's just, it's a lot of work to process acorns into a significant carbohydrate source. And I mean, it's so funny because there's so much demonizing of carbohydrates in our current culture. And that's because with industrialized agriculture, carbohydrates are just so cheap and easy to come by. Just raining like, down on us, aren't they? Totally. But in a, in a primitive situation, like getting carbohydrates, like that's some serious calories and, and super you want duper them. helpful. Yeah, definitely. And you're burning them too. You're burning them all day. Yeah, for sure. And so I think I think that looking at um, looking at these ways and efficient ways of dealing with all of this stuff and like stuff that you can like when a huge harvest is coming in and there's acorns coming in and there's chestnuts coming in and it's hunting season and ev- like you're saying like everything's piling up all at once and it's um, knowing what you can just set aside and let sit and, or what you can put in a pit and Mm -hmm. come back to, you know, and like with deer hides, like, like when it's, when it's time to, um, when you're processing a deer, like I take the hide and I wrap it up and roll it up for like, a day and then I eat the organs and process the rest because you want to eat those first and then process the rest of the meat and then come back and scrape or flesh the hide and then I put it in a creek for a few days and then I go back to dealing with the meat. You know, it's like, it's like having, having these processes and these ways of doing things that like we know how to do with like other stuff in our life, you know, like first you, first you drive, to the store and you get the food and then you (laughs) bring it, you know, it's like, it's like that's been lost and the community aspect. I think that's a really good point. Like, like, and when I've lived with bigger groups of people, like we would have a, we would, this is really funny. We would have a deer camp every year where we would drive up to Virginia and Virginia has so many deer. There's like roadkill everywhere. And so I'm in Ohio. You know, one day in Ohio, I passed 40 roadkill deer. Wow. Insane. Totally insane. That's a lot and of backstraps so, sitting on the ground. <laughs> a lot of backstraps. And well, that's actually what I ended up doing. We were like past so many roadkill deer. I don't really do this much anymore, but at the time, this is like, <laughs> I don't know, many, many years ago. And I just, I just would go and get the backstraps out. And then we made backstrap jerky on the dashboard Mm. of the car (laughs) Um, but anyway so we would go up there and we would make this giant trench fire and we would can the meat which canning canning meat over a fire it takes three hours to can it over the fire only an hour and a half if you're pressure canning but um you can safely can meat if you if you boil it actively for three hours so we'd have two wash tubs going with meat canning and then another big pot so a water bath, basically. A water bath. Yeah, yeah a water okay. bath for three hours. And then we'd have another pot going where we would just be heating up water because we'd have to we'd have to make sure that the water level in the water bath stayed above the level of the jar lids. But um, we would be canning meat, we, canning like the um, 
canning like the flank meat and the shoulders. And then we would be making jerky out of the hams and the back straps, or we'd just be eating the back straps. Um, and so we would have like eight people together doing this. And I mean, it went so fast and um, with bears, you know, processing a bear is intense, especially if the weather's not cold <laughs> yeah. and you can't just like yeah. meet outside. And, and that's another bear thing. season here is like August, September. Oh, so, wow. I mean, it's always warm when, wow. when I process a bear. It's, it's sometimes hot when I process a bear. Wow. That's tricky. That's totally yeah, tricky. Hard. Yeah. Here a lot it's of coolers. Yeah. A lot of coolers here. It's different. I mean, here you can hang. I mean, that's a great thing about, about meat. Like you can hang a whole ham or a whole shoulder. And as long as there's air all the way around it, even if it warms mm -hmm. up a bit, it's not going to become, well, I don't know if I should say this with <laughs> insurance or whatever, but like, but like the, the bad bacteria really come in when you have an anaerobic situation, like right. when the meat is wrapped in plastic or whatever. So I'll often hang, um, hang hams and hang shoulders for like a couple weeks outside, as long as the yellow yep. jackets aren't around, like, uh, yeah, yeah. carnivorous insects. Oh my God. And they like, they tunnel <laughs> yeah. in, but the flies, like they can't do anything as long as once it dries. Exactly. On the outside. Exactly. So it's funny how refrigerations made people think like, it, it, you know how it is like people see an egg out on the counter and they lose their mind or something, you know, it's like, oh my God, get it in the fridge. And oh it's like, God. do you have any idea how long this can be out? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Like, cause I'll, I love to let a deer hang for a couple of weeks. Oh, I yeah. think the meat gets so nice, you know, but. so much better. And, and you know, it's, there's, there's just so much litigation. I think, yeah. and I think also right. people's digestive systems are, have right. just become so wimpy because right. they're not, they're not growing up like eating anything that has any sort of bacterial load. And well, just hearing you describe some of these things you've done in the past, like your flora <laughs> is obviously very different from somebody who's lived their life, like indoors with like a Lysol can all the time, you know, like a, you, you, your, your heart, you got a much more indigenous and hearty kind of a, in, you know, intestinal tract. So yeah. I think like you're saying, a lot of people, it's been a lot of antibiotics, mm -hmm. not just internally, but externally throughout their entire home. Yeah. You know, sometimes like I think about in a hotel, it'd be like, how much has been, how much Lysol has been sprayed Ugh. in this room in the last 10 years? You know, it's yeah. daily. So yeah, people have like kind of these, not just wimpy, but like maybe like lifeless. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like the surface of Mars in their gut. Oh my God. Yeah, definitely. Well, and what they're eating too. I mean, eating a bunch of food that has pesticides and herbicides in it, like yeah, that's killing. Right. Anyway, I could wax poetic on all this. And I mean, all this to say, like, you know, I used to get all of my water out of this, out of the spring or out of the creek. And now I have like a sink and I turn it on and water comes out of it. It's so domesticated. Amazing. down. Adeline. I know. I know. It's, it's, it's a little crazy, but it's pretty fabulous, especially when you have a four-year-old. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think that there's, there's something really to be said for living at least in your young adulthood, like a little on the edge. Like, I yeah. think that it, I think that it kind of gives you more grit and more ability to be adaptable and to be open to different ideas. And I don't know, I'm happy that I had that big part of my life that was super intense. And now our school, you know, it's like, it's funny because I think it's like pretty, pretty plush, you know, with the whole running water. We even have hot running water, and <laughs> showers and, you know, all this stuff. But like, but like, it's very um, outdoor, you know. And Rustic for the folks who are visiting. <laughs> yeah, which has actually been super, yeah, and we have an outhouse, you know, and stuff like that. But um, it's actually been great during COVID because all these people have had to shut down what they're doing and we right. are just outside. And so yeah. it's been fine. We just wear, wear masks and we're outside and whatever. A buckskin mask on. Um, you know, my wife and I have been talking about uh, people who've coming of age right now uh, because she traveled a lot when she was young. I traveled a lot when I was young. It sounds like you did too. And, and to me, well, we were talking about how important that is for rounding out your mind, especially like that culture shock stuff can be so good for you long term. Mm. But then I was also saying, you know, it's not like historically that's been the norm because access to the world was very restricted in the past. But with the COVID situation now, I think, you know, we know people who are 
who are at that age where it's like that person needs to go traveling, but they, they, it's not a time where that's accessible yeah. right now. And it's like, Oh, how's that? What's the impacts of that going to mm. be on a generation? You know? Um, I also want to go back to what you said about carbohydrates. Cause I, I, I think it's funny. I've been in these scenes where it's like, well, fat's really bad for you. You shouldn't eat fat. And then it's like, well, carbs are really bad. You shouldn't have carbs <laughs> too much protein. It's like, well, what am I supposed to eat? That's all. That's all the foods, yeah. <laughs> you know, like I'm, I'm just going to eat all three and I think I'll be okay. But, uh, <laughs> and but with no the acorns, nightshades. Yeah, don't have any nightshades, right? <laughs> exactly. No or meat. Uh, oh my gosh, right? It just goes on and on, and yeah. it's like gets to be where it's like, what? What do I eat exactly? Uh, but with acorns, um, you know, when I I don't grind animals like with a hand grinder. I use motorized grinders, and they're very effective and very fast. Yeah. And I've got some nice ones. But when I grind my acorns, my mill is like a hand thing. You know, so yesterday I was teaching a, a girl, one of my uh, wife's students. She's this teacher, so we were teaching this girl how to process acorns, and uh, I got the idea to like hook up my cordless drill oh, yeah. to my, to the auger, oh, yeah. and it was for a minute it was awesome until like this pin sheared inside oh, and the no. whole thing broke apart. Now I'm like, yeah, I gotta I gotta fix it, but uh, yeah, back to you know that idea of of lots of people like the hand grinder is not a big deal if it's like a bunch of people mm-hmm. we're all doing it together, but doing all this stuff on your own, you start to see the value of the running water and the sink yeah. and the electricity because that power takes the place of all of that human power that no lo- we don't have the access to anymore. So I think that's like one of the big challenges. Well, and time, you know, it's like, it's one thing to spend your, like I did, you know, when I was living at Wild Roots, I just spent my time doing primitive living. But like, if you, at this point, you know, I run a school And I have a daughter and like the amount of time that I have to dedicate to food processing is like a fraction of what it used to be. And so if you don't have the time, it makes it, it makes it really overwhelming and in some ways inaccessible. And like, I used to can so much of like what I got out of my garden. And nowadays I'm like, okay, every year I eat a lot of fresh food out of my garden and it's awesome. And I can tomato sauce and that's great. Right. You, know? you kind of have to pick your thing, right? That's yeah. it. Because it's yeah. like, you can't do everything. I'm, I've hit the maximum of what I'm able to do. Cause I process a lot of animals and mm-hmm. that's a lot of work and, oh, yeah. and it'll get really, you know, when you got like, I'll, I have to put a lot of animals in the cooler cause I hunt deer in the summer for nuisance permits on farms and uh-huh. then also hunt bears. And so I'll have these animals in a cooler where I'm putting ice to them every day. And it is like stressing me out to like get yeah. it done. You know, it's like yeah. knowing that I could lose it. And so it's like trying to also do my cranberries and process my apples and do my acorns. I'm like, I've kind of reached the maximum point. Yeah. And I, I sort of see the value now in like each person kind of focusing on a different thing. And then mm. we keep those skills alive as just, I don't know. It's like that what's that book Fahrenheit 451? Is that it? Everybody like memorizes a different forbidden book. You know, it's just like your job's like you learn this book. Like that's your, you carry that with you, you know, that's your medicine or whatever. Yeah. I mean, Um, and then trading, like someone's the bear fat person and they like perfect their technique. And yeah, I mean, in, in our, like, I think there's this idea of like, even the idea of self-sufficiency, the idea that each unit, family unit is like doing everything themselves, I think is totally bull. Like it's so much better to have some people that, you know, everyone maybe has a basic understanding of all the things. I think that's important. So you know what goes into it, but then to have like specialty, like I really like butchering, you know, Mm -hmm. and if you don't want to, if you don't want to butcher your pet, goat that you've gotten close to like I'll be your butcher you know and that's something I used to be kind of the neighborhood butcher and um, I just did a go- I just did a pet goat for somebody actually oh, yeah. the exact scenario you described well it's such a, g- a gift to people and it's yeah. I mean it's interesting because I learned all my butchery skills from um, wild animals which it sounds like is similar to you but it's been cool to bring that into some domesticated animals too we used to have actually a um, butchering class a humane butchering class and Oh my gosh, we got so 
hammered by the vegans. I mean, I was getting all these death threats, like, they, and it happened three weeks after I had my daughter, and I was, you know, thirty-seven years old, like, not a young, you know, oh wow, right yeah. back to it, mom. Like, I was, I was, I was up there, and then, and then death threats, and like, I got like fifty phone calls in one day. Like, nothing's how can off you the kill table for these an folks. Animal? Like, <laughs> blah blah blah. You're killing a sheep one sheep and I'm like dude you know you know there's these processing plants in North Carolina that kill probably 8,000 pigs in a day like go there where's your priorities at? Yeah, so, so <laughs> seriously weird. I guess I'm the low-hanging fruit but really uh, yeah and like nothing's off the table like I was my friend Arthur just recently it was like the somebody Somebody sent, I think, uh, one of his posts around to like a real militant vegan community. So he had like 800 people on him and uh. just totally comfortable making death threats to his daughter and making oh, sure they were like, come on, you guys, uh. like, where are your priorities? And the thing is, as you know, and like I know, in four or five years, they won't be vegan anymore because <laughs> almost none of them are. And then, you know, it's like, then you got to just live with the fact that you acted like that it's so bad. That's and, you know, because, you know, it won't be long and then they're on the carnivore diet. You know, yeah. Balance it back out. <laughs> I want to talk with you about tanning hides. Um, yeah. And I want to talk a bit about, you know, that's another one of those things. Like every year I end up with all these hides and I'm like, eh, I'm overwhelmed by it. And uh, yeah. I only really understand the process from like a sort of um, tertiary, you know, level, yeah. like I, I'm not deep in it. So talk to me about tanning hides and I guess maybe back up and let's talk about buckskin because what an incredible material and what an ancestral fabric. So buckskin is really fabulous like it's totally different from most leathers like some people compare it to suede but it's it's a totally different animal so to speak um it's like buttery soft and mm -hmm. it's slightly stretchy and it smells really yummy and it, does, yeah. it feels really good like straight up against your skin like totally unlike a lot of a lot of leather products like i make um, and for years I wore like a buckskin bra, you know, and buckskin bikini top oh. and, and like, <laughs> cool. um, and I wear buckskin dresses and buckskin skirts and they're more comfortable than cotton. Um, it's not good to have like a heavy hide and long sleeves in the summertime because it can get kind of hot. Um, but in the summertime, I just, I just wear, I have a pair of buckskin shorts and a buckskin skirt. And um, yeah, it's just a lovely material that is super versatile. And when you think, I mean, it takes a lot of work to tan a hide, you know, it's like, it's like for a beginner, it's three to four days to tan a hide. Like at this point I tan hides in batches. And so like, you know, I'll scrape five hides at once and then I'll soften five hides at once and blah, 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 to the point where it probably takes me, a, when you do the math, that's probably like eight or nine hours or something to tan a hide. But, oh, um, wow, not bad. No, it's not bad. But when you start out, you know, like anything, it's much lower. And so I recommend, I have an online hide tanning class. I also have an in-person hide tanning class. And the online hide tanning class, I tell people they should set aside um, three to four days, but that three to four days can be broken up, which is something that's nice about the online class is um, you can break that up into like two hour chunks, like throughout a year, because there's a lot of places where you can put the hide on pause. And when you think about it, like in a, um, in a big picture sense, like, I mean, now we can go and get clothes for almost no money. It's just, crazy the industrial Un horrible. isn't it unbelievable it's insane but when you think about like if i was to grow the cotton and spin yeah. the cotton into yeah. thread and weave the cotton and then yeah. make clothing out of the cotton then the buckskin seems like wow that's like really easy in, yeah. in comparison yeah. and so um and so it's a really lovely material. It's incredibly durable. Um, like a pair of car hearts is nothing compared to a pair of buckskin pants. Um, but because of the time that goes into it, like, you know, when I used to commit take commissions to make someone a pair of buckskin pants. I mean, it's like a $1,200 pair of pants, you know, because there's like multiple yeah. hides and all the time and you sew it with the buckskin itself. You sew it with a buckskin thong, which is so much stronger than any thread could be. You can also use right. sinew from the animals, but it doesn't work as well. And um, yeah, so I love buckskin. I love walking through the forest 
dressed in buckskin or just with like a buckskin garment. And I just feel like, I mean, it's something spiritual, you know, I just feel more part of the forest and it just feels really sweet to me. And I, yeah, I love it. And I don't make clothes to like, look like an Indian or a Native American, you know, like I, I tailor my clothes to suit my style and I, um, yeah, they're really beautiful. Oh, your course is exciting to me. I want to, I want to get into it a little bit more. I, I, but I want to just talk about that thing you just said. There's this, oh, there's this thing going on where, where there's somebody who's always willing to criticize you no matter how hard you work, right? Like there's right now it's gotcha culture. So everything's cultural appropriation, of course. And um, one of these things to me is it like with buckskin where it's like, I understand where someone's coming from if they say like, oh, you're trying to look like a Native American, Mm -hmm. but it's like, we're talking about something that's, this is everybody's history. There are like, like, um, and if I start copying an exact, Mm -hmm. like this is a garment worn in a specific ceremony, like I Mm -hmm. understand that that's appropriation, but like, we all come from mammoth hunters. Like, you know what I mean? Or like, we all come from like people who wore hides. Like there's just no way around that. So it seems like these skills, I just maybe to clarify Mm -hmm. that these, these are like, everybody shares this ancestry, right? Yeah. Pretty much all of our ancestors tanned leather and there's lots of different techniques for tanning. And in Europe, a lot of bark tanning was used a technique similar to brain tanning which is the type of the type of buckskin that i make is brain tan buckskin was practiced by the sami people um, and still is practiced by the sami people and by um, the zulu people in southern africa but primarily the brain tan buckskin technique was practiced mostly in what's known now as north america but interesting I, the zulus and the sami i mean yes. you couldn't really get kind of more divergent <laughs> right yeah. they're very different places and i mean uh, probably other lots of other people but the sami practicing. now like I, it, with the Sami people, uh, you could almost see then that that might be where it came over to North America, like sort of making its way across Siberia and then down and through the over the Bering Land Strait. You think? I have no idea. I mean, yeah. it, with, with all these primitive. <laughs> Come on, you must know. <laughs> no idea. I mean, all these primitive technologies. I mean, I don't think it's like somebody was scientifically experimenting with different yeah. things back in the day. I think like there was some miraculous like thought that occurred to people in all yeah. these different parts of the world. Probably some plant told them or something according to me, but I'm my own, have my own funny ideas, but that, um, that like, and, and what actually happens scientifically is that you're using the lecithin that's in brains and the fat that's in brains, the lecithin puts the fat into solution. And so just like if you're making mayonnaise, the lecithin that's in the egg yolk allows you to add, exactly, it allows you to add the oil and then it emulsifies everything it allows the fat to go into solution and so you're putting your hide you take your hide you scrape the flesh off you scrape the hair off there's some chemical things you can do with wood ashes and stuff to make that go a little smoother and then um you scrape the hair off and you scrape the layer under the hair that's called the grain. And that's the shiny layer that's on like shoe leather. You scrape that off and then you put the hide into a solution that's made up of either brains or egg yolks and some kind of fat. I usually use a bunch of olive oil and then water. And you put your hide into that. And so the hide sucks up all of this, all of this juice. And then you do a whole bunch of various techniques of wringing it and, and pulling it. And there's all sorts of things you do. And you go back and forth between that solution and drying the hide out and that solution and drying the hide out. And then eventually that solution through all of these various techniques works its way between the fibers of the hide. Like the hide is kind of, it's a network of fibers that's kind of like, like felt, you know? And so that, um, What starts in between those fibers of the hide is basically hide glue. You know, it's like it's it's going to make the hide super stiff when it dries like a rawhide bone, you know. So you're Mm -hmm. replacing those glues with um, with lecithins and fats. And so then 
as you're drying it the final time and you're keeping the hide moving so that those glues don't set and make the hide hard, then those fibers of the hide get coated by fat, which is a lubricant. And the lecithin is like the chariot upon which the fat rides to be able to coat those fibers. And then when the whole process is done, you have all of those fibers really smoothly being able to move past each other. And that's why it's so incredibly soft. And then you smoke, you use smoke to penetrate through the hide and that waterproofs the fats that are coating the fibers of the hide. So that was kind of a, kind of quite the dense explanation but that's no that that's, actually i didn't find that very i found that very useful um because i was going to ask you sort of like well i th i think people maybe don't they don't know that so maybe it's like so i do i skin the animal and put the hide on like how does this, how does this work like how do i get to this um wh what's the difference when like for instance you talked about uh doing a bear hide wow which man that oil <laughs> i feel bad whenever it's only my friend arthur and uh, his wife sarah do some bear hides and i just know how much work it is to get that fat off but yeah. um what's it what's going on when there's hair on a hide versus um when the hair's off like how is this changing the way something gets processed um so that's a good question. So when you, when you do a buckskin, which deer hides are typically done hair off because the hair is very brittle. And so if you tan kind a deer hide. too. Not like yeah, it's like a, it's not like not, a fur. Yeah, no, it's not super nice. It's hollow. And so it just breaks. And then you end up with, uh, it's very funny. One of my ex-partners would just be driven crazy if there was any deer hair in his house. <laughs> so like I had to like be really careful because I was tanning like, I don't know, 30 or 40 hides a year at that point. And so I just have to be really careful before I went in his house. But um, whatever the case is, deer hair, deer is usually tanned with the hair off. And so when you're scraping off the hair and then you scrape off that grain, that allows the brain solution to be able to penetrate from both sides of the hide, which makes it a little bit softer in the end product and easier to work to make it super soft. When you're leaving um, a fur on a hide, which you would be more apt to do with like a um, raccoon or a fox or a coyote or something like that. Bears also, although bear hair, I think is like kind of in between. It's not that nice. It's kind of nice, but yeah. It's, it's, yeah, I get you. Yeah. But anyway, so the, um, although I definitely it's nice have, to look at, but it doesn't yeah. have, it's not quite that soft. It's, it's not like a fur bearing animal, right? Yeah. And maybe up North where you are, the bear hair is a little denser, but here it's a little sparse too. So that. Oh just, yeah. We'll get them. They'll get pretty thick here as the winter's yeah. getting closer. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, um, when you tan a hide with the hair on or the, or the fur on as the case may be, then you are getting all of your brain penetration just from the membrane or excuse me, just from the flesh side of the hide or the membrane side of the hide. And so you have to work harder to get it softer. But typically uh, okay. when you are tanning something with the hair on, it's more of an outer layer garment. You know, it's not, you don't usually wear a fur right up against your skin. Usually you have mm -hmm. some other garment right up against your skin. So you want it to be soft, but it doesn't have to be quite as buttery as okay. a, um, as a buckskin does because the buckskin you want to be like right up on your skin. And I don't like having rough things on my skin. I, uh, I harvested a couple of deer this summer that, uh, like I said, off nuisance tags for this farmer and they were mature bucks, but oh. their hides in the summer, I, th I think like each hide could have fit in a, like a one quart Mason jar. Wow. Right. When they have that really, really thin summer hide. Yeah. Um, do you, do you think about that or is that like a factor, like how thick the hide is from what time of year? Does, does a thinner or thicker hide make a better buckskin? Um, you know what I'm saying? Or do you, do you yeah. use them for different applications? I use them for totally different applications. And the biggest difference that I notice, and I, I've definitely seen that seasonal difference with roadkill and stuff, but the, um, the biggest difference I find has to do with whether it's a doe or a buck because the does are much more stretchy because their belly, oh, like wow. their hides are made to be able to expand and contract, you know, no to way, be able really? to bear, yeah. bear a, bear a, huh. uh, 
font. That's set, a, the word. set of fonts, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, and so the buck hides are much more tight. And so if I'm making a garment that is going to be very fitting, I actually, my favorite thing to use is a young buck or a summer buck could be a good thing because, um, because I don't want it to stretch, you know, mm, whereas yeah. if I'm, if I have some garment that it doesn't matter if it stretches, like if I'm making a dress and dresses, like I'm not typically worried if those, if those stretch, whereas like I'm actually wearing a buckskin vest that is like very tailored. And so if that buckskin vest stretched, it would just lose its shape, you know, whereas the buck is the buckskins are going to have a tighter grain and they will be less likely, less likely to stretch. If I'm making a pair of pants, I always use bucks because otherwise it can look like you have a dump in your pants. Um, <laughs> I've if, seen if some like hides, that. Yeah. yeah, totally. Which is not, not my thing. And um, the does are much easier to tan that, um, that they're, they tend to be a little thinner. And I think that stretchiness just means that the fibers of the hide open up more easily. And so they're easier to tan, um, but they are not, and, and they usually end up being a little bit softer, but they're not appropriate for super fitted garments. And um, yeah, I've, it's, it's funny because I actually get my hides mostly from this uh, deer processor and it's pretty graphic thing. Like, you know, cause they just have this trailer that they hard, uh, that they haul to the dump. And so this trailer is full of deer hides. So I'm, I bring my rubber boots and I'm like, in yeah. this like carnage of hundreds of deer, you know, <laughs> right. it's like really intense. And um, so, and they usually typically cut the skulls um, when they take the antlers off. And so I'll also bring like a bag and I'll bring a spoon and I'll just the spoon brains. out the brains. <laughs> <That's really laughs> but, um, but anyway, and I'll cut off the heads and I'll cut off the legs and I'll leave them, them there. Unless I'm doing a big perennial planting on my land, in which case I bring the deer legs home and put them in the ground in the ground oh yeah, yeah i love that oh that's yeah. really cool it's yeah it's funny like because earlier you were talking about sort of stories of your mom introducing you to some of this i'm thinking of your daughter when she's on a podcast in the future talking <laughs> about my mom's scooping brains with a spoon the feeling i think it's pretty sh shocking to people to feel for the first time what brain actually feels like because mm. like you were saying before about the lecithin and the oil it's it's this like once you touch brain your hand has that it's almost like Looking at the uh, the cost and the abundance of women's skincare products, especially facial skincare products, you're like, how is there not like a brain product? Do you know what I mean? Because you touch yeah. that, your hands are like, it's like a dry lubricant or something, right? You know what I mean? Like you feel like your hands just slip over each other, but they're not wet, but they're like freaking moisturized, right? It's a really during, strange feeling. During high tanning classes, I often talk about how someone should make a brain-based um, women's skincare product. Oh, good. It's so not just it's, me. It's like our, our, uh, our brains are, are working similarly. Our, our, fat, our fatty, less than rich brains. There you go. Maybe it's something about the year of 78. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. Um, I like in your course description, the way you, you have a couple funny things in there. Cause one, you sort of say like, Hey, this is like hard. This isn't easy. But then you also say uh, that if you can jog around a track once, you should be able to tan a hide. Yeah, I think totally. that's so funny. Oh, really I mean, like you that. could probably like walk quickly around the track once. Like, I mean, yeah. It, yeah, I was trying to come up with something because I mean, it's it like you said, it's not an easy thing physically, but I've had, I mean, I've had hundreds of high tanning students in person as well as with our online class over the years. And like most people should be able to do it. If you have a lot of shoulder issues that can cause some problems, or if you're just like, it's just like, sitting on the couch watching TV all the time and eating and you weigh like multiple hundreds of pounds over your ideal weight, probably, probably not, not tanning a thing for you. Yeah. But I mean, if you're in reasonable physical condition, um, you don't have to be able to run, you know, five miles or 10 miles, just like once around with jog, slow jog around the track once, like you should probably be fine. <laughs> you can do it. Yeah. But the shoulder, the shoulder thing definitely can, can be an issue. Um, but man, I've been, I've been, this is so funny. I've had so many issues with my shoulders and my hips and various things as I come into middle age. I've just started doing 
more like intentional workouts. My body feels so good. To. So you good. To, right? It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's really yep. such a big deal. And you know what? Work is not a substitute because no. it's like, I don't know if it's because it's not symmetrical or because it's yeah. not the repetitive or whatever it is, yeah. but I have to do, I'm in pain if I don't yeah. turn you know, yeah, and it's, yeah. sometimes I'll be like, I wish I could spend this, t- like, I wish my rowing machine ground acorns. That'd be great. You know, I'd love uh-huh. that or whatever, yeah. you know, <laughs> like I have this water rower that I'm using or when I'm running, it's like, man, I wish this was, I was do getting some of my work done, but it's, I, I can't, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I have to train physically yeah. or else I'm, I'm, I'm a wreck emotionally yeah. too. Like I'm irritable. I'm <laughs> totally. cantankerous. I mean, yeah. if I'm yeah. feeling like in a grumpy mood and I go for a run, I come back, it's like, Oh, look, somebody took his serotonin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, I know uh, exactly what you mean. Exactly what but, you mean. Uh, and just hit tanning hides, or just building, or just whatever. Even if you're yeah. getting the art, getting the exercise, like you need to round it out. And yeah, yeah. I don't know. I love my weights. But anyway, yeah. moving on. So, uh, um, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say, like, you know, I promised my friend Arthur because you know he's always been trying to like coax me towards some of these skills and. And I spend a lot of time hunting and processing animals, but I'm not really processing hides. And, and yeah. so I said, okay, here's the deal. I'll be buried in, a, in an outfit that I make. Like that's the, yeah. <laughs> that's the only pressure I'm putting on myself, right? So nice. I'm really interested in your course because I, I want to do this. And I'm thinking about people who are listening who are maybe they're, they've been hunting a while, maybe they're new hunters and they have access to a hide. Or um, from what I'm hearing from you, what if somebody doesn't hunt, but they want to, they want to take your course like, how do you recommend they get a hide? And then the other question I have is sort of like, how much infrastructure do they need to get this done? Because you do yeah. need some some tools, right? Yeah, you totally do. So um, in the online course, we walk you through like how to get everything. And so like for the, for the scraping beam, for example, you can try to, you can use a tree trunk or what we typically do is use a piece of PVC. Uh, piece of like six inch PVC and we talk about where yeah, to get from the hardware it store and, or whatever. Yeah, from yeah. the hardware store um, or often from a construction site, you can find a situation. So we, <laughs> yeah, we, right. we go through the whole technique of where to source everything and, and um, how to build it and all this, which is very simple. Like you don't have to be a carpenter to be able to figure out how to, how to make this stuff. We, and we're very clear when we walk you through it. And then as far as where to get a hide for a specific window of time during hunting season, we sell hides if, if you want one. It's not like something we oh, really nice. push. We just work with a hide tanner who, who does, it, does the whole thing for us. We don't like make money off of it. We just mm-hmm. want to make that be a service. And then, um, but you can, you can call your local deer processor. I was going to say around are, here, they'd just love for you yeah, to come take some of those. Yeah, from- they they love it. And actually in North Carolina, it's illegal for them to sell them. So oh. um, they can charge a processing fee, which I think is very fair. And it's like five bucks or something, you know? Um, yeah. But in most states, in most states they can sell them. And so, I mean, you're not going to pay much. Like you're going to pay like, like probably somewhere between three and 20 bucks to get a deer hide from a processor. We, okay. ch- we charge, I can't remember exactly what it is. It's around 40 because he not only gets the hide, but he has to scrape all the flesh off of it and dry it to be able right. to send it to a person. And oh, so okay. that's yeah, a good, right. good bit of work. But so if you can, the ideal thing is to just get it from a local processor or if you live somewhere, you know, hunting season is, upon us in some places and fast approaching in other places. And so if you put up a a sign in a local like gas station or whatever saying like, I want your deer hides, you know, oftentimes (laughs) you'll be covered up with them. But the key is you want hides that have been pulled off of the deer rather than cut off of the deer. So, so in order to get a hide that's high enough quality to be tanned, you just cut around, you know, the neck and make a slit down the front and cut around all of the legs rather than you and then you pull the hide off rather than using the knife to take the hide off the whole, yeah. the whole way. Is that just because of how many like you know, <clears throat> cuts and checks you make into the hide in yeah. the process of using a knife? Yeah. Exactly. Many of which don't go through all the way through the hide until you're starting to tan it. And then, uh, and then they okay. break open. Right. Uh, got it. What do you recommend as a first project for somebody to do? Like they get their hide done. <sighs> 
you know, I'm just thinking too, it's like every time I process a deer, it's like, I look at that hide. I mean, I feed them primarily, I feed them to coyotes, you know, yeah. and uh, I love listening to them back there, but it's like, they don't nice. need every single one. So sometimes it's yeah. like, every time I have that little bit of guilt where it's like, oh, I'd really like to do something with one of these hides, but I'm so busy. And, you know, and I, and really, you know, I just need to kind of walk through it. I like the way that you've done the video course, but, but like, what do you recommend people do for their, for their first project once they have the hide done? Once you have your hide done, I think making a um, making a satchel or a bag is a really great first project. If it's a bigger hide, which up north, I mean, you all probably have like much bigger deer than we have here. You could probably make a vest or make a mm -hmm. pair of shorts can be a great thing. Although the shorts are definitely a little bit more tailoring. Like the bag, the bag is very simple. But with the course, we also um, we also include. Um, uh, tutorial on how to make things with your hides and on pattern making. And we specifically have a class on making a buckskin satchel or like, you know, carrying bag. Um, and we have another one on making a buckskin skirt. Okay, cool. So you can learn some of that, like stitching and stuff. Yeah. I, uh, I want to, um, I want to ask you, I want to kind of close out today talking a little yeah. bit about, um, you were talking before about bringing women into many of the things that you do. And I want to give some time to talk about that. Um, yeah. but, uh, lastly, maybe just tell people like about where to find the course. And I know you made a coupon code for this audience. So I want to make sure they know about that too. And, um, and then I want to kind of talk a little bit more, you know, about that side of your business. Yeah. So the, um, the course is on our website, which is wildabundance.net. And if you go to wildabundance.net, the top bar, um, one of the top bar menu, one of the options is online classes. And you just click on online classes. And then the online high tanning class is one of them, along with we have an online gardening school and spring wild foods and other online classes. So that's how you get to the page. And the coupon code is wildfed, all caps. And that's for 10% off the class. And we have a lot of different pricing options. Um, we have a sliding scale and we also offer payment plans. The um, coupon code is only for full paying. Um, we can't do it with the payment plans, but um, but yeah, so we want to make it accessible to everybody. So. That's really nice that you do the sliding scale. It's really cool. Cool. Because it seems like a lot of people who are interested in this <clears throat> stuff, yeah, I imagine you get a lot of folks who are sort of um, bucking the current economic system. Yeah. Uh, and then you probably have folks on the other end of that who are just like, hey, this is like a hobby thing for me. I have a full-time job. So it's nice that you make it accessible to everybody. I appreciate that. Yeah, totally. Totally. So tell me, tell me about this. You were bringing up before, the idea particularly of you talking about like women doing carpentry and stuff. So it's like pretty iconoclastic, right? And something that you wouldn't normally, I mean, I'd never seen like a women's carpentry class. It's really cool. Um, tell me a little bit about working with women specifically with these skills and kind of like what that means to you and, and your business. Yeah. So about, I'd say a third of our classes, none of our online classes, anybody can take our online classes, but about a third of our in-person classes here are um, specifically for women. And we do women's um, carpentry. We do an advanced women's carpentry. And we also do a women's rewilding class. And what I like about those classes is there's something really special when you get a, in a group and it may be like this for men, I have no idea. But when you get in a group that's all women, where the competition factor and the idea of like having to like, having to like prove yourself or like show what you know or whatever, just totally disappears. And everyone's just in this really um, open, like an open vessel type of space and totally um, just into learning and not posturing and it feels really lovely and it's also like you know I have made my way in this field of primitive skills and in building where there's not many women you know like when I when right, I right. was when I started the firefly gathering like at that time there weren't any other women who were like leading any of the major primitive sk skills events in the country. And that's changed since then, which is awesome. But I think that there's something about um, putting myself in a position of leadership that has, that has inspired a lot of women. And I think that having these classes that are all women, it allows them to relax into learning 
and just feel really nurtured in a really, really sweet way. And I'm sure there's, I know there's all men's things that happen too. And I bet those are awesome too in a different way, I imagine. But um, yeah, it's really special and it just feels really gratifying. And it's not that like, I hate men. I love men. I don't right. get me wrong, but, um, but I do like to do these skills sometimes in all women's um, spaces. And it's funny, my partner, who's a man, um, he, when there's all women's classes here, he'll sometimes say like, wow, everyone's just so happy. I love these all women's classes. People are just so happy. And um, it's just, yeah, it's just really sweet. I, I really love that you do that because I have noticed in some of the primitive skills communities I've been a part of, there's a contingent of sort of gender politics that's come into it a bit. And I find it odd because in primitive societies, there was a very, you know, there was a lot of things, men did some these things and women did these things. And that wasn't like uh, mm. a tension there. Now I'm really glad we've removed a lot of gender barriers, but I yeah. have noticed if you get a group of men together working on something, as soon as you introduce a woman into that circle, the mm. entire thing changes. Like men's brains just shift into a, <laughs> we, we speak differently. We act differently. Like we can't, we don't say the same things. We don't, we, it just changes and, and yeah. that's okay. But it's also nice. I just, I'm glad that you offer that because I think that needs to exist in addition mm. to things that are co-ed as well, you know? So yeah. um, I really like that. Uh, Natalie, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so yeah. much for your time. Is there um, anything as we wrap up like that you, uh, you want to share or say and uh, anywhere you want to send people to find your, um, your info? Yeah, I'm just have been really enjoying our conversation. It's been really fun. So thanks so much for talking with me. And um yeah, wildabundance.net is pretty awesome. We have a newsletter. And like I said, there's the there's the online high tanning class and lots of online classes as well as on-site classes. But we also offer a free newsletter that is really fabulous. And it comes about once a month. And we walk you through um, what to do in the wild, in the orchard, and in the garden each month. Wow, and so that's, that's a really nice. cool f free resource. And there's a blog there that has lots of recipes and, um, you know, probably our most popular blog is our persimmon blog and our pokeweed blog. So if you want to know about <laughs> persimmons or pokeweeds, you oh, can check it out. I'm interested in that pokeweed blog. I'm a little north of the persimmons, yeah. but we get some pokeweed yeah, up here. Yeah, it's good stuff. So cool. So people subscribe over at your yeah, website. Yeah, obviously. they subscribe at the website just on any page. If you scroll to the bottom, you can you can subscribe to cool. the class or to the newsletter. Awesome. Cool. Well, hey, I'm glad to have yeah. connected and uh, I'm glad to have uh, Wild Abundance and Wild Fed be, be you know, connected entities. Yeah, so uh, again, thanks for your time and uh, looking forward to connecting with you again. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.